My guest today is my dear, dear, dear friend, TV and radio host, Carrie Kasem, daughter of Casey Kasem, but most importantly, founder of Kasem Cares, which she started to protect the elderly and the vulnerable from abuse in this country. If you want to find out more, please go to kasemcares.org. She is a force to be reckoned with and one of my best friends, and you're about to see why. Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I'm I'm so glad that you're doing this. You are, you know, an interviewer extraordinaire. Um, we've known each other forever, and this is sort of the first time we're actually working on something like sort of professionally together. So thank you so much for for coming on and and helping me with this. Thank you. I, you know, anytime, anything for you. I I'm in awe of you. You are a true Wonder Woman. You are a powerhouse. There's very few people like you on this earth. So I feel honored to be able to talk about this with you. It's a it's a heavy subject and a lot of people yeah. don't want to talk about it. You know, they ignore it. And you not only not ignored it, you've you dived in where most people would never, ever think of going. Where it's almost like a movie. When you tell me about your life, it's more of the movie than when you tell me about parts you have and, and acting. So um Thank God for you and thank God for what you do. And I really want to get it out there. So talking about human trafficking is not an easy thing. And no. I know that you have had a pretty hard childhood. And my first question to you is, is that why you're so drawn to this? Is what happened to you in your childhood? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's what I know. Um you know, I wasn't, I wasn't trafficked, but I had a hell of a time. <laughs> I had a hell of a time. And, um, I just know that had that been now, I would have ended up as one of these girls and I would have been gone and I would have been trafficked. And when I first started learning about what was going on with kids and what the, profile was for the kids who get kidnapped or taken or whatever, I I was like, oh, thank God, which is horrible. But thank God this wasn't happening when I was a kid because I would have been that in a heartbeat. And I couldn't, you know, I said this before, but like I literally couldn't sleep when I was learning about this. I literally couldn't sleep. I couldn't believe that kids were being um kids are being raped every day and taken from their families or their friends or just from the life that they thought that they knew. I had a bit of reality, tiny bit of reality on sort of what that, sort of what that is like. Are you okay to talk about that? I am with you. <laughs> and you know, I get asked it all the time. And so part of me is like, yeah, because I want anyone out there who knows, who has anything similar to know that you can keep going and you can move on and, and it doesn't necessarily kill you. Do you know what I mean? So for that reason, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it doesn't necessarily kill you. I have to tell you, I've, uh, I've had some friends that didn't make it because of that. It's a uh... It's a horrible, traumatic experience that I think you have to be very strong to get through and to be able to lead a normal life, right? After something traumatic happens. And sure. um, you've not led a normal life, you've led an extraordinary life. And I wanna know how, how you took such a tragic, horrible situation in your life and became who you are. It took a while. <laughs> it's not like, you know, I, I really did. I really did have a choice. Like, I remember it was like, I'm going to go this way or I'm going to go that way. And for a while I went this way. For whatever reason, I, um, was sort of introduced to sexual inappropriateness, you know, for as long as I can actually remember. The first time was, um, I think I was four, four or five. And, and I remember talking to like 
the girl across the street who I was becoming best friends with. And I remember asking her, how old are you? And I remember her saying, I'm five. And me going, I'm five too. <laughs> so I remember that was five. And there was a neighbor who was much older neighbor, like my neighbor, like literally next door neighbor, like my bedroom looked into their bedroom and they had three boys. And the oldest one was, you know, older. And, um, he wasn't even a boy. Um, but he still lived at home. And, you know, back in the day, this was when like, you would go outside and you'd play until the streetlights came on. There was no, you know, there was, there's no internet. There's no nothing. Like you want to do anything besides sit in your room, you go outside. And so I did. And it was, a, you know, outside of that, it was a semi-cool neighborhood to grow up in. But the neighbor would basically um, play baseball in the front yard. And he would like, come here, I'm going to teach you how to bat. And he'd be towering above me because I'm five. And it started out with like him sort of putting his arms around me to teach me how to hold the bat. And then he would, I remember they collected baseball cards and he would, got me into collecting baseball cards and he would drop the baseball cards down my shirt. And then he would like bring me into the garage to see like the other baseball cards. And then he would shut the garage door and then he would, um, you know, slip his fingers. Um, so hard to talk about. Um, he would slip his fingers up through the side of my shorts and touch me there and put my little hand down his pants and stuff like that. Right. That must've been terrifying. I didn't, I didn't know. Like I knew that it was wrong and I knew that like no one should know about this, but he would tell me I was pretty. He would tell me, you're pretty, you're so beautiful. I'm five. And the problem was, first of all, there's the guilt because I kept going back. And I would go and he would say, wear those shorts tomorrow. And I'd wear the shorts tomorrow. You know? Yeah. I mean, but it wasn't like, like my house was the house that no one came over. My house was the house where, you know, my dad sort of, you know, he sort of lived in his underwear and always had a beer. We always had beer in the fridge. We always had wine. We always had that. And no, you know, we didn't have like once in a great while I would have like a like a sleepover for my birthday party. But that'd be it. It wasn't the house that you came over and knocked on the door and came in to play. It just wasn't that. Right. It was pretty volatile. Like it was, my dad's answer to everything was to whip off his belt and go to town, you know? Were you scared that they would find out about this? Was this something that you were terrified that your parents would find out about if you kept going? Was that also? There wasn't that play? much. I, we believe, I mean, like we really were not close. There was, I was literally just trying, you're just trying to get through. I was more concerned about the belt. I never knew what I did to get hit ever. Like I still don't, like I, I'm like, I don't remember, like I made noise or I did this and I would be told all the time, like, you're bad. I, oh my God, constantly, you're, you have the devil in you. And I had two younger brothers and I thought it was me because I was the only one getting hit. I didn't know. So I thought I must be bad. I must be terrible. I'm such a bad kid. So I thought, here's this guy who's paying attention to me. And telling me I'm pretty and just paying attention to me in a good way. Yeah, the attention was nice. The attention felt I didn't good. know. The love felt good. Oh, Whatever yeah. The, 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 and yeah. so I just went back. And then eventually they, he left. Like he, he left. Like he moved out of his parents' house. But by this time, I'm sort of like, I'm that girl. 
Like people don't believe it, but like I'm the girl in junior high that had the tray and no one wanted to sit by. And I'd be like, I would panic because I hated lunch because I was like, where do I sit? I have no place to sit. And I'm the one that would get pegged last or second to last Yeah, yeah. for the teams. Right? Same. Same. And I hated Same. it. I hated school. Hated. hated lunchtime was the worst. The worst. Oh, yeah. Hated it. The worst. And all the popular the girls and everyone around me was named, you know, like Jenny. <laughs> yep. Jenny. Jenny. But I e or Jenny Y or Jessica. Yeah. And I was Marisol. I mean, I hated it, right? And I wanted to look like everyone else. Everyone else was was like, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes. And I would constantly get the, where are you from? And I'm like, here. Yeah. No, where are you from? In front of the whole damn class. I hated it. But I'll fast forward to the one that I've sort of talked about. I want to answer your question about how did I go from there to here? Yeah. So you fast forward to like, now I'm... We moved a lot in this town, a ton. My mom always wanted like a bigger house or whatever. So we'd move. And uh, so I moved between seventh and eighth grade. And between seventh and eighth grade, um, I put on makeup. And these are all new kids. And out of the blue, I'm pretty. Out of the blue, not only do boys want to talk to me, but girls do. The popular girls in the school are like, hi. And so this is where I get in trouble. So my friend, I'm going to say her first name because I want to call her out. Her name is Sally from this old school. She was new, right? So she was a new girl, but in this old junior high. And she's like, hey, I want to take you out. I want to take you around and show everyone how pretty you are. I'm so stupid. So stupid. What happened? So she invites me to this party to show these guys how pretty I am with the older guy that she's dating. And so I sleep over at her house. That's how young we are. And we're going to ride our bikes to this party. I can't make this up. On the way to the party, I get hit by a car on my bike. Almost like the universe was like, don't go. Almost like that. I get hit. I'm crossing this four lane thing on my bike. Sally goes first. I go after and a car stops to like wave me. And so I pass that car and this other car goes, Psh! and I hit the pavement and I'm so stupid. And the driver of that car is a girl and her mom and they're freaking out and they're like, we want you to, we want to go to the police station. And I'm like, no, I'm okay. Meanwhile, I sprained my arm. I've twi like, it's not good, but I want to go to the party. <laughs> Cause I'm an idiot. I want to go to the party. So we go to the police station. Literally. I went to the police station twice that day. So we go to the police station. My parents know nothing, by the way. They just think I'm spending the night. And I tell them I'm fine and I'm okay and it's all right. And they're like, okay, just be careful on the bike and whatever. And I go to the party. And they have this bong. Now, I don't know what the frick a bong is right now. I have no clue. Right? And they have a bong and they have a giant bottle of Seagram 7 whiskey. And Sally goes in the other room with her boyfriend. And there's five other guys there. Right? Some I know, some I don't. And... I'll never forget, like they're teaching me how to do the bong. I don't, you know, hold it in. Like this is the first time ever I've done anything like this. And I'll never forget, like sort of like the last thing I remember. I remember drinking this whiskey and the last thing I remember is this guy, Mark, I'm not going to say his last name, but this guy, Mark, 
And everyone in this town knows this story. Everyone in Naperville knows this story. I remember sitting on a chair and him sitting opposite me and him leaning towards me with the whiskey and tilting it up and saying, drink. And me just... Next thing I remember, I'm uh, laying on a bed and uh, I don't have any clothes on from here down. Like nothing. Nothing. And these guys are around the bed. And Mark is walking towards me and he has no clothes on. And I remember trying to get up and I couldn't physically like get up, passing back out. That's all I remember. Next thing I remember, I'm on the sidewalk. I'm on the sidewalk and outside, no idea how I got there. And I'm being kicked. Get up, bitch. Get up, bitch. They're literally kicking me. And somehow or another, I said, I want to go there. And there was the police station, <laughs> like there. Because I had this idea that if I could get to the police station, I could get home somehow. Then I remember, next thing I remember is waking up in my bed that night. That's it. Nothing else. My underwear's on backwards. I somehow got there. And the phones and my my... Dad had apparently picked me up. Um, I didn't. I didn't know anything, and then the phone started ringing. And somehow or another, whatever happened, like this is the same night. So my friend Sally calls me, and it's like, "Oh my God, Marisol, what happened?" And I'm like, "What happened? Why did you leave me?" She's like, "You wouldn't get on the bike. I didn't want to be late for dinner." She left me. She left you. She didn't call your parents. She didn't help you. She left you. The next day, my mom finds out and she tells me, well, that's what you get for drinking. That's why we tell you not to drink and you're grounded for six months. And I'm like, you've never, and I remember telling her this, you've never told me not to drink. Like, it, this, is not, this doesn't come up. Like, it's not that kind of a, of a, you know what I mean? And so I end up going to school. I have a sling on from the car accidents. Uh-huh. And I'll, I walk into school and ev everybody, like a slow-mo, like a, like slow motion, like just converges and hey doggy style. I didn't even know what that meant. Hey, doggy style. How was your weekend, Marisol? Hey, hey, bitch. Hey, slut. Hey, this. And I'm like, I don't, I remember just trying to hide in my locker. The teachers knew. The teacher in third period, like I never forget, pulls me aside and goes, Marisol, I heard about what happened this weekend. You need to be careful because a girl can get a bad reputation. Not. Did you, what did you help? What did Nothing. you say I to didn't this know teacher to that pulled say. you aside and didn't, I didn't ask know if you what, were out? I, I didn't know what to say. Another teacher, everybody knew. I was the girl. I was that girl from that party who all those guys. And I didn't remember a thing. And by the way, ye, like, like a year and a half later, one of the guys from that party goes, you don't remember what happened, do you? On the phone with me. I'm like, no. And he proceeded to tell me more that he did. Like it was like, like it was nothing. I'm like, I'm, what? He's like, oh yeah, you did this. Apparently I walked into people's houses. I don't, I don't remember to this day a thing. So I get to high school and this is the point where I said, I was like, I, 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 I can't do this. I don't know what to do. I did every drug I could get my hands on. I blew up an entire row of freshman lockers because I hated them. Um, wait, 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 like, hold on. wait, 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 back up. You actually blew them up like, like, like with explosives. I never told you the story. I know a lot about these stories. I never told you the story. I'm actually like evilly proud of it. Isn't that awful? <laughs> I did not know you blew up. This is okay. Tell you? This gets good. No, <laughs> you have to tell me this. You've never told me you've blown up your lockers. This is, 
<laughs> okay. I can't believe I didn't tell you this. Okay. Remember, this is like the 80s, right? And so big hair is like the thing. And um <laughs> Aquanet. Aquanet, like everywhere and big bangs Aquanet. and the whole shebang. And so somebody, some genius had invented this curling iron uh, that, it, that instead of being able to plug in, the curling iron is filled with butane, lighter fluid. Remember this? So you yeah, could yeah. turn it on and like curl yeah. your bangs in between. <laughs> yeah. People kept it in their lockers because you didn't need to plug you it in. You kept it in the locker. Yes. So, didn't I don't know what I was thinking, or, or I, I just didn't even think. It was sort of like, I know what to do. I'll take a piece of paper, wrap it around the curling iron, light it on fire, and shut the locker. The locker, yeah. the entire row <laughs> had psh, exploded and it had exploded and gone and all the lockers had gone boom, 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 like dominoes. <laughs> like I said, I had two choices, which way to go. That's the way I went. Did you ever think that that would bring you full circle back around to what you are doing now? Because it's what, it's your acting that allows you to do what you are doing now, or most people could never. And I, I do want to talk about that. I want to do, I mean, yeah. the special ops, this, the secret operations, like what you do and putting your life in danger um, to help and to save children. You went through this horrible childhood, very dark. You become an actress, but then you're using both the things that what happened to you in your childhood and then your acting to come all full circle to help kids that have gone through traumatic experiences like you. I mean, and yes, I'm not comparing, but it's traumatic, you know? Rape is traumatic, Jesus. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So tell me about that. Tell me, tell me about how you got into this. Well, you know, I was lucky enough at one point or smart enough at one point to look around at my life when I got a little older. I think I was like older, older, I was 17. And I looked around at my life and I was like, if I don't, if I don't do something, I'm going to be dead. I'm going to be in jail. Cause I had friends that were, all my friends were older. They were going to jail. They were going to prison. Um, so it was almost as if like I decided. And then like, I think it was like, uh, when I was 19 or 20, I think it was 19. I found acting like, like I tried out for play as a joke just to see if I could be an extra. I'd be an extra, <laughs> you know? And, um, and I got the female lead and I was like, what? So you fast forward. And like, to me, when I found acting, it was like, all of a sudden it was like, it was, this was something I was good at. I was like, I'm good at something. I didn't know that. And it was the first time that I ever had like someone teach me, care for me, believe in me. You know, like it was a thing. You had never taken, you hadn't acted through high school. No. You'd never taken a lesson. No. But it saved my life to some degree because I, I found something to do. And I didn't have to like get attention by being an, an idiot, you know, <laughs> like being a jerk. And you know, I was still a disaster when it came to relationships, like a disaster, but I found at least something I was good at. You know what I mean? Right. So your question was, how did I go from that to going undercover? I mean, you needed those skills, right? You had to have that set of skills to do what you're doing. Did you even think that it would come back around? Did you think your life would come back around to dealing with what you're dealing now? Did you know you were going to help? Did you know, did you, was there any, like, did you ever have that thought and just not know how you were going to get there? It was not until I had my daughter that I was like, I, I can't have what happened to me happen to her. Like, there's no way anything like this is ever going to happen to her. I had never held a baby. I had never changed a diaper. 
ever. Well, I'll never forget like that night I'm in the hospital bed and she opens her eyes and she looks at me and I was like, hi. And I was like, oh. I'm your mom. It's so nice to meet you. Yeah. And it was like that vow of like, this little being is trusting me to raise her and take care of her. And that's my job. That's my duty now. It's not about me. And everything just came and you just know what to do. Kind of. I, I, I don't have kids, but I can't, I, I have loved like that. And I have experienced certain things with babies that are just the most beautiful thing that, that connection, you know, it's, I'm, I don't have that. I'm not a mom. I don't have that. So it's really beautiful to hear that. But when you, it's like, they're innocent and I've looked in the baby's eyes and it's just like when they stare at you and it's almost like they yeah. recognize you, they recognize you. I've met a couple babies where I'm like, I don't know. I, I know you, you know, and it's this instant connection, but it's beautiful to hear you talk you. about that. It's, um, yeah. it's sort of like with kids, I know what it's like. I remember being a kid. I remember how lost I was, how vulnerable I was, how sensitive I was, how adults didn't, not many adults took the time to talk to me. You know, I remember, I remember like, I hated, like adults always smiled when I would cry and I hated it. It was something I hated more than anything where like back then people just got hit. It was just a thing, I guess. So my dad would like do this and I'd be crying and bawling in shame and embarrassed because it would happen in front of anybody. And I remember the adults seeing me cry and they would look at my mom and dad and smile. Like, like I was just a difficult kid or something and I hated it. And so there's just, I, I never forgot what it felt like to be a kid or a teenager lost and confused. And so I've, I've had that sort of, I get it. And so when I meet teenagers and Riverdale opened up that whole audience to me or kids, it's like, I, I care about them. And I guess when I first started hearing about trafficking and what was happening to kids. I was like, what? The acting thing. I was just like, look, at the same time, I was like, to me, it was like nothing else matters but this. And so I was walking the red carpet. So you know this, right? So you're in Hollywood. You get an invitation to go to somebody's red carpet event that's promoting X, Y, and Z. Your publicist says, in style is going to be there. So-and-so celebrity is going to be there. Please go. And you get your stylist and they give you some clothes and you're going to walk the red carpet. And then Access Hollywood and Entertainment Tonight are going to ask you why you're here. And you have a little cheat sheet that you've memorized on the way there. So I was going to one of those. Yeah. And I was spewing out the quote. And at the same time, it was when I was learning about all of this stuff happening with trafficking all over the world and in the United States and in Los Angeles and in every city. And I was like, I don't care. How come we're not doing this for trafficking? And I was like, okay, we're not doing this for trafficking because yeah. no one knows. So maybe I could let them know. And maybe I could do an event like this and have people walk the red carpet and give them cheat sheets and then get all the press to cover it. And then they'll spew out the statistics and say stuff. And then I could let people know. And that's how I got into it. That's what I did. I was there. Yeah. It was amazing. It was an incredible event. You got it out there. And, the, but then. Thank you. Yeah. You went farther. Though. You went farther than what most people who open a nonprofit and spread the word and share and try and get people, you know, to help you put your life in danger. And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about Tim Ballard. I want to talk about, you know, how did you meet him? How did he go, okay, yeah, you can tag along on this incredibly 
dangerous operation. You may not return home, um, but you know, let's do it. I, how? Okay, just walk me through that. <laughs> so um, I was <laughs> I was doing my second red carpet event, and um, I, I would what I would do is I would award these organizations that I had met when I was pulling the string and finding out about trafficking, but essentially giving them a voice to come to Hollywood, give them an award, and then I could attach a celeb to come and present the award, like Terry Crews came uh, to present the award to the organization. And at the same time, then they, that person could speak and thank for the award and talk about what they did. And I could trick celebrities in the business to learning about human trafficking. So I needed a keynote speaker. And so somebody I'd met in DC said, what about this guy, Tim Ballard? He just left the CIA and he formed his own organization called Operation Underground Railroad and you should meet him. And so I met him. We hit it off like it was instant brother and sister, instant. And I was like, you're the guy that goes out and gets, gets them. You're, you're the guy that goes and gets the girls and finds the kids and rescues them. He's like, to the best of my ability, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, will you come? And he's like, absolutely, I'll come, 100%. And I'll bring my friends and I'll bring, he brought the attorney general to come and speak. And he would see these guys like face to face and put them in jail and get the kids out. And I was just like, I want every part of that that I can possibly be a part of. And so the risking my life, well, it started out on like a slow gradient, like, it started out, why don't you come with us to Haiti on and up, but just, just to watch. And I was like, yeah, I'm coming. And I jumped on a plane and I went. And it was on the way back from Haiti that he had said, we have to stop over and do this thing. And um, do you wanna, we actually could use a female. Do you, you could probably play the role of this woman who is setting up like sex parties in Dominican Republic. Do you think you could do that? And I was like, huh? And he's like, yeah, you just need to like, da 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 da. And this is the story. And we're trying to get this information from this guy, an American citizen. Could you do that? And I was like, sure. <laughs> and they started pulling out like their little pen cameras and little voice recording equipment, put it in a baseball cap and put it on top of my head and da -da -da -da, let's do this. And I was like, okay. And I did it and I did a good job. And I came up with a character like that who was like, um, I was like, what kind of person goes and gets American citizens and has them travel to these foreign countries to have sex with kids and sets up the thing for them to do this. What mindset. But I'd been playing characters for 20 something years, you know? Not just the ones I got hired for, but how about all the ones I didn't get hired for? Where I had to come up with a character. So I just was like, well, I'll just come up with a character. And, and it was good and it worked. And so then a little while later, I got another phone call from Tim. Hey, do you want to, we're doing these ops in California. Do you want to I could use a female. Do you want to come? And I was like, okay. So, and it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed until all of a sudden I'm doing the ones that scare the hell out of me. And I am risking my life. And I don't mean to sound like I'm risking my life, but no, this one is like, what if I don't come back? And I would tell him, I go, I'll do anything you want. Just get me back to my kid. I don't care. I'll do whatever. Just get me back to my kid. Just promise me I'm coming home to my kid. And he'd be like, I promise. And I'd say, okay. So, but some of, the, some of the stuff that you guys have gotten into that you've told me, I don't know if it's public I knowledge. I don't know what I can, can't say. But there's stuff where if there's one um, question, like a, if there's anything, I, I know that you were recognized at one point um, in a town you were at, which could have gotten you killed, first of all. Um, but if there's anything that they find out about you or somebody, maybe somebody recognizes you and you're in the SOP and you're deep in it and somebody Googles you and there you are as an actress, 
I mean, you're done. Like they could, I mean, I'm done. and there was a point. Yeah, you're done. You're not. How do you, how do you deal with that? Do you just kind of just push it aside and say, this is for the greater good. This is for a better thing. This is saving children. And you just let that go. You just, how do you, how, how, how does that work in your head? It's, um, it's really hard because I struggle when it's a deep, deep, deep one um, on whether or not I want to go. Like, I've got a kid who I am 100% responsible for, and she loves her mom. And the only thing um, when I do say yes as I go if this happened to my kid, I need someone to go get her. I need someone to risk their life to get her. And let's also keep in mind, I'm told at the time, no one else can go. Like, I need you. I need you to do this with me. And I'm like, okay. Like, I've been told, like... I'm an actress, right? So I can change my voice. I can change my looks. I can change how I stand, how I walk, my color of my eyes, my hair, all of it. I can become a different person, which, you know, knock on wood has saved my life in certain situations. Um, apparently cops aren't trained to do that. They can't really do that. And it's far and few between that I know of. I, there's, I, you know, we all watch spy movies. Like, it's so weird. Like when I'm there and they're like, okay, here's your burner phone. Here's the safe house. I'm like, this sounds like I'm in a movie. This is insane. Here's our getaway car. We got to switch out cars. We got to do this. We got to do that. Here's our escape plan. Here's, and I'm like. There was one you told me about where you didn't have, there wasn't backup allowed because they took everything from you. They took your phones. They took everything. You were on your own. I don't know who was with you, but it was you and maybe Tim. I don't know. But you were on your own and there was no backup. There was no help. There was no way to call it and there was no way to get out. You had to act your way out of it. That one was scary. To be yeah. fair, there were safe houses. They were just far away and you had to get to them. And we had no weapons. Um, so we had no, it, we were it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I found out later, by the way, there was a helicopter standing by that should we have to run and she went down, they were ready to helicopter us off the island. But you had no communi no way to communicate at all. And that's where you're just like, you're banking on your acting skills to get you through the entire thing. Like you are, you are hoping to God they don't recognize you, hoping to God that, that you have passed one of their disgusting tests. Your confront is like, I mean, it literally is like, wow. It's just, it takes somebody that has um, a bigger purpose than who they are, than what is going on, than your life, than your family. It's just such a massive purpose to be able to do that. It's such a massive ability to confront that. Like, where did that come from? I guess that's what I want to know. Where did that confront come from? Part of the confront comes with what I've been through. You know, part of it comes from, you know, I've been in situations that I, you know, haven't gone into either with you yet, you know. Um, but I've been in that you're on your own and you need to figure that out position. Um, young, you know, you know, I was sort of, uh, just, there's been situations that I've been in that I haven't gone into that were terrifying, terrifying. And I had to figure it out and I had to survive. I had to literally figure how the fuck am I going to get out of here? How am I going to, how am I going to do this? Young. And I did. And it's sort of like that cliche of like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 
it's sort of that. I was marathon. I was literally this. I was about to say you are the exact like the epitome of that. <laughs> that is exactly what, what I. Those were my next words out of my mouth, because some people it destroys. Some people and some people it makes them stronger, and it just made you superwoman. It made you Wonder Woman. I'm not. You know? I'm not. It, I'm not superwoman. Are, I'm not Wonder Woman. I I am terrified. I'm scared. It doesn't. It, I, I don't care what you say. Listen to me. You are Wonder Woman for real. For you are a real Wonder Woman on this earth. You're one in a billion. There are not people who would put their lives in danger to, re to rescue kids. There are people who don't even believe this is happening because they can't confront that thought. Fair. And you know, it'd be, I wish I had a life where life was so good that I didn't, ha like I wasn't even aware of the horrors, I guess, of the world or whatever, but I didn't. I just didn't. And look, there's also like... a these guys, like the team at OUR and the sheriff that I work with and these other guys that I've worked with, they do this day in and day out. And they, they really do. And it literally is like, oorah, let's go. Um, but as a girl, it gets a little scary because I'm not a Green Beret. I'm not a Navy SEAL. I didn't go through this military training. I didn't go through the police force. I didn't go through these things. Please stay next to me. <laughs> like... You know, so it's me, little old me, and then I got like these huge guys as a team off sort of like holding it at bay so I can do what I do with my partner or depending on the situation, right? But I'm, the thing where it comes from, it's like, what am I going to do? Say no? Hey, Marisol. Hey, Marisol. There's a situation where all these curls and kids are being sold for sex in this area. And we need you to come help. And I'm going to say no? I can't say no. What am I going to do? It's, I don't really have a choice. I have to say yes. And, you know, this last one that I did, it was so much. And I didn't cry until... We got the girls out. Like, I was back in America. I was back in my home. And once you see certain things, like, it's, it's really hard to go back home because you're like, like, you're so in, like, that's not a double mirror. The door locks. They're not coming in the door. This is my kid. This is my neighborhood. This is a normal... This is not the third world country that I was just in. Like it's 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 like a shock, right? And but I didn't I didn't I just held it and 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 held it. And then I think three weeks later the big team went in and they were able to get the girls out and did do one of the takedowns of one of the ops that we did during this time period. And for some reason, when they they sent me the pictures and they sent me the footage while they were doing it. <sighs> Then I cried. Then I cried. I don't know why. I don't know what happened. I couldn't stop crying. It was like holding it because you have to hold it. And then for some reason, like once they, they got out, I wrote a letter to my kid, which she's never seen, in case something happened. I wrote a letter to her and I gave it to, to my friend, Sigrid. I said, if I don't come back, just read her this. And I explained to her that I'm only doing this because I didn't want her to think, God forbid, this never happens. Like, this is never going to happen. But just better safe than sorry. I didn't want her to think mama died saving someone else's kids. And now she's out of mom. I wanted her to know that I was doing this because I'm trying to create a better world for her to grow up in and for her kids to grow up in. Then I'm like, wouldn't it just be great if we had a world where we didn't have to do this and where kids could go out and just play till the damn streetlights went on and come home when the streetlights are on? I want that world again. Yeah, it would be great if politicians took this more seriously. It'd be great if there were stricter laws, you know? So I'm doing this podcast and thank you for coming on. Thank you so much because you. you're a whole warrior yourself and you better have me on your podcast so we can talk about what you do. You can interview me. But yeah, 
please, I want to, but Absolutely. thank you. Of course, of course. I'm just, thank you for sharing, you know, um, that's hard. It's, uh, it's not easy to share what you shared and it's not easy to do what you you do. And I want the world to know who you are and what you do and people to really understand that this is an epidemic and this is in your backyard. It's not just in third world countries and it can happen to your kid. And people, they, for some reason, just don't think it can happen to them. They give their kids full reign on the computer. They don't know who they they're don't know. No, no. You could go out one night, sneak out, meet a girlfriend. Uh, yeah. And there you'll never see your kid again. It's insane. So, you know, thank God that like people are talking about this more. There's TV shows being made. I'm trying to get one made. There's news pieces on this way more than there was back in 2012, you know, but we need like an army. We need an army and it can't just be people who have lived through this or gone through this or know someone that's gone through this. We need like the good people that never even knew about this to get on board and to fight it. It doesn't mean that other things are not important. I know other things are important. I know that. And I'm happy to lend my voice or help in any way I can. But kids are being raped. We need to do something now. At the tune of 4 million children worldwide. What? What are some action steps that people can do right now um, that can help? I know it sounds stupid, but share the podcast. <laughs> like something as simple as share the podcast. Uh, click subscribe, that kind of thing. It lets others know that people are paying attention to this. And if people are paying attention to something, more attention gets there, more coverage gets there, more, more things will also come. It's sort of like a magnet. So sharing the podcast, clicking subscribe, watching it on freaking YouTube, going to slaveryfreeworld.org, my nonprofit or our.org or anyone else that we have, we always tell them what to do. And subscribe, sign up for the newsletter. We need money. It's not free to go do these ops. It's not free to create. I'm creating a curriculum to give to schools so that teachers can teach their curriculum and teenagers will know, or moms can download it. None of that stuff is free. It takes money. Even if it's like, oh, I can, I can do $25 a month. Thank you. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. That's like That's three coffees at Starbucks a month. I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take anything. By the way, just so the audience knows, like, this is my girlfriend. Like, we, we're now going to go and talk about, like, facials. And we're going to talk about makeup. Oh, and yeah. we're going to talk about yeah. lipstick and fashion yeah. and all these fun things. <laughs> like, you can be and do these great things because Carrie Kasem has a phenomenal nonprofit. We should probably talk about that here. But you can, uh, you can do these things and you can make a difference. And you can, you can help and support and not lose your life. You can, yeah. you can do that. And I want yeah. people to know that, you know, it's true. And it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding, you know, and you, it's just, it's such an amazing thing to have that purpose and to help. It really, really is. And if you can find that passion, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be human trafficking. It doesn't have to be elder abuse. It doesn't have to find where in life you have a fire to help a passion to help and, and do it because if everybody did that, you know, the world would be such a better place. Yeah. So I also want our audience to know that not only is my beautiful, amazing friend, Carrie Kasem, a phenomenal human being, but she also has an incredible nonprofit called Kasem Cares. Go to kasemcares.org. She has been fighting for elderly abuse forever. In fact, she was the person who I asked, hey, how do I form a nonprofit? How did you do that? I want to know how to do that. And she was the person I went to. So she's phenomenal. Please go on. And I'm so honored that she's my guest.